tonight. Back to the polls. India resumes voting in its third phase as Modi prepares for a sweeping victory. Time to talk. China's Xi continues his tour in Europe as the EU attempts to negotiate the strategic trade and policy positions of the global leader. Putin in power. Russia sees no surprises as President Vladimir Putin is sworn in to be the nation's leader for another six-year term. And gala glamour. The first Monday in May sees stars grace the red carpet. Met gala magic, this time in Sleeping Beauty style. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. You're joining us on World News. Glad to have you tune in as we bring you the latest updates from across the globe. We start off tonight in neighboring India, where the third phase of elections are currently underway. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi voted in the third phase of the country's general election. Modi is seeking a rare third straight term in a vote which pits his Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party against an alliance of more than two dozen opposition parties. Surveys suggest he will win a comfortable majority. Today's pollings cover 93 seats in 11 states and territories with Gujarat and Maharashtra in the west and Karnataka in the south accounting for 50 seats. that would complete voting for 283 of parliament's 543 elected seats the world's most populous nation began voting on april 19th in a seven phase election in which nearly 1 billion people are eligible to vote with ballots set to be counted on june 4th modi urged citizens to actively participate in the festival of democracy while taking care of their health as summer temperatures continue to rise in many parts of the country clad in saffron and white he was surrounded by hundreds of supporters and party members signing autographs and taking to children on the way to the polling station Now Chinese President Xi Jinping continues his tour in Europe at a time of growing economic and trade tensions. She was in Paris where French President Emmanuel Macron and EU Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen urged him to ensure more balanced trade with Europe. We have a responsibility to ensure a level playing field for all, Macron said ahead of talks during the two-day visit. The EU is investigating Chinese industries such as electric vehicle exports, while Beijing has started an anti-dumping probe on French cognac. For his part, she says China's relationship with Europe is a foreign policy priority. China always views its relations with the EU from a strategic and long-term perspective, he said. During the Monday visit, Macron and Xi also reviewed French troops at an honor guard ceremony. Chinese state media reported that Xi, behind closed doors, said he hoped EU institutions would quote, develop the right perception of China. French diplomatic sources said the Chinese president appeared receptive to his counterpart's comments on trade, but it's unclear if that will lead to action. The world cannot absorb China's surplus production. While speaking to reporters, von der Leyen said both sides' relationship is hurt by unequal market access and Chinese state subsidies. I am convinced that if the competition is fair, we in Europe will have thriving, durable economies that will support more good jobs. Chinese media reported that she told the leaders from a global perspective He doesn't think there's a problem with overcapacity. Still, a sticking point on the European side is that EU members, especially France and Germany, are not united in their attitude towards China. Macron also pressed the Chinese leader to use his influence on Russia to end the war in Ukraine. According to state media, she said China has been working vigorously to facilitate peace talks. And while she is in Europe, China is facing tensions in an entirely different continent. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said that it was unacceptable for Australian defence personnel to be put at risk in international airspace by the Chinese military as they took part in an operation to enforce United Nations sanctions on North Korea. A Chinese fighter jet endangered an Australian military helicopter during an unsafe, unacceptable confrontation over the Yellow Sea. 
The Chinese Air Force Jet J-10J dropped flares about the several hundred meters ahead of an Australian Seahawk helicopter on a routing flight in the region as part of an operation to enforce sanctions against the North Korea. The helicopter, flying from destroy HMAS Hobart, dodged the flares. Australia's Department of Defence said in a separate statement that the confrontation put the aircraft and those on board at risk, although no one was hurt. China responded to the statement, saying its military took necessary measures to warn Australia. And we're in Russia now, where there are no surprises as President Vladimir Putin was sworn in for a new six-year term at a Kremlin ceremony that was boycotted by the United States and a number of other Western countries due to Russia's war in Ukraine. Putin, in power as president or prime minister since 1999, begins his new mandate more than two years after he sent tens of thousands of troops into Ukraine, where Russian forces have regained the initiative after a series of reversals and are seeking to advance further in the East. At 71, Putin dominates the political landscape on the international stage. He is locked in a confrontation with Western countries he accuses of using Ukraine as a vehicle to try to defeat and dismember Russia. And just before his swearing-in, we see some nuclear actions being taken. Russian President Vladimir Putin has ordered tactical nuclear weapons drills in response to what the Kremlin says are provocations and threats from the West. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Monday sent a warning to the West by ordering tactical nuclear weapons drills. According to the Russian Defense Ministry, the Southern Military District's missile units have begun preparations for tactical nuclear weapons drills set to take place in the near future with the participation of its Air Force and Navy. The ministry explained that Putin ordered the drills to defend Russian territory and ensure its sovereignty in response to provocative remarks and threats by the West. This comes as French President Emmanuel Macron raised the idea of sending European troops to fight Russia in Ukraine, while British Foreign Secretary David Cameron said that Ukraine has the right to use weapons provided by the UK to strike targets inside Russia. Moscow has also accused the US and its European allies of pushing the world to the brink of a nuclear war by supporting Ukraine with tens of billions of dollars worth of weapons, some of which it says are being used against Russian territory. The Southern Military District is headquartered in southern Russia near the Ukrainian border. It operates in Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia and Kherson regions, which Russia claims were newly incorporated during its special military operation. We're going in for a short commercial break now. We'll be right back with more key global updates. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We have some updates now on the war in Israel. A ceasefire deal for Gaza remains uncertain as Israel rejected a proposal from mediators from Qatar and Egypt and went ahead with attacks on Rafah. That followed reports that Hamas had accepted the terms of the same proposal. According to senior Israel Defense Force spokesman Daniel Hagari, the IDF hit some 50 facilities in the Rafah area, while Palestinian and Egyptian officials said Israeli tanks moved to the outskirts of Rafah on Monday night. This comes after the leadership of Hamas accepted the terms of a ceasefire deal proposed by mediators from Qatar and Egypt. However, Israel said it would not accept the deal. According to a statement released by the Israeli Prime Minister's office on Monday local time, the terms of the ceasefire were still far from meeting Israel's core demands and its war cabinet voted unanimously to continue its military operations in Rafah. Israel, however, said that it will send its negotiators to talk to mediators to try to reach a ceasefire agreement on terms that are acceptable to Israel. On the same day, Hamas announced it accepted a three-phase deal for a ceasefire, saying that the ball was now in Israel's court. And the acceptance of the deal came just hours after Israel ordered an evacuation of some 100,000 Palestinians from Rafah as it said that it would continue with its military operation in the area. The first part of the three-phase deal includes the release of 33 hostages taken from Israel in exchange for a six-week-long pause in fighting where Israel will allow Palestinians to freely move from the south of Gaza to the north. This would be followed by another 42-day truce, which would include the withdrawal of most of Israel's troops from Gaza and Hamas releasing several Israeli soldiers in exchange for Palestinian prisoners. 
The third and last phase would entail a full hostage swap, as well as clear guarantees for an end to the war from countries, including the United States. The U.S., which is one of the mediator countries in the talks alongside Qatar and Egypt, said that it is reviewing the response. So I can confirm that Hamas has issued a response. We are reviewing that response now and discussing it with our partners in the region. We continue to believe that a hostage deal is in the best interests of the Israeli people. It's in the best interests of the Palestinian people. It would bring. And still on the Israel-Palestine conflict, some Columbia University students shared their disappointment at their school's decision to cancel its main graduation ceremony after weeks of pro-Palestinian protests. Around 200 people rallied on Tuesday in support of Jewish, Israeli-American and Israeli students they say face harassment, intimidation or violence amid ongoing pro-Palestinian protests on New York area campuses. Students on campuses across the U.S. have protested for weeks, calling for a ceasefire in Gaza and divestment from Israel. And some universities, including Columbia, called in riot police with batons and flashbang grenades to disperse and arrest them. The school said it cancelled its graduation ceremony because there'd be insurmountable security concerns with over 50,000 attendees and said it was deeply disappointed but that it would still hold smaller school-based ceremonies at another complex five miles off campus. Other U.S. universities have struggled to contain disruption to their commencements. Over 300 University of Michigan faculty, staff and alumni signed a protest letter against their school, requiring commencement volunteers to undergo training to stop hecklers. Some staff balked at being asked to quell, quote, people trying to express free speech. University of Southern California called off its main stage graduation last week. It came after outcry over a decision in mid-April to scrub the valedictorian speech by Muslim student Asna Tabassum. Senior leadership said that was due to safety concerns and passions around the war in Gaza. And on the road to the White House tonight, Donald Trump has the polling lead over Joe Biden in the critical swing states, with six months left to go before U.S. voters elect their next president in November. It marks a stunning reversal for Trump, who exited the White House in 2021 with a record low approval rating of 29%. For more on this, we have other than the world news special correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. What are the latest updates, Suzanne? Well, Anuradhi, with six months to go, here's where the race stands. National polling has been tight. Trump and Biden are both polling just above 40 percent, with Trump currently holding a slender edge of 0.8 percentage points, well within bounds of the statistical error. The independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has been polling at about 10 percent, though support for such candidates tend to be higher in pre-election polling than in actual elections. In seven cr crucial uh, swing states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, North North Carolina, uh, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Trump leads by Biden by between one and six points. Overall, 41% of a percentage of voters trust Trump with the economy compared with 35% for Biden. While inflation has certainly hurt Biden, political views of the economy also play a role. Of those who said that the economy was poor, 41% said the change in political leadership in Washington would improve their perception of the economy, while 37% said lower inflation and 14% said better personal finances. Other top issues including immigration were polling suggestion. Voters believe Trump is more competent than Biden. Over to you, Anradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than World News Special Correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. Trump's legal troubles continue to mount. The judge in Donald Trump's criminal trial fined him a thousand US dollars and held him in contempt of court for a tenth time for violating a gag order and warned that further violations could potentially land the former president in jail. It's not the first time Trump's been held in contempt of court by Justice Juan Merchan 
who last week fined Trump $9,000 for the same reason, violating a gag order prohibiting him from making comments about potential witnesses, jurors, or court staff related to his trial. He remains free to criticize the judge and Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Trump stands accused of falsifying business records for what prosecutors say was a hush money payment to an adult film star. The district attorney alleged that in the waning days of the 2016 presidential election, Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, paid Stormy Daniels $130,000 to keep her quiet about what she claims was a 2006 sexual affair with a former reality TV star. Prosecutors say Trump didn't want the reported affair to become public as he sought the White House and accuse him of hiding repayments to Cohen by falsely labeling them, quote, legal expenses. They have absolutely no case. It's a political hoax. It's election interference. Trump has pleaded not guilty, denies the affair, calls the prosecution an attempt to undermine his presidential campaign, and on Monday continued to rail against what he's called an unfair gag order. And I'm not supposed to be talking about it. But I am allowed to say that the judge has a conflict that, like, nobody's ever had before. You ought to take a look at it. He's taken away my constitutional right to speak. Prosecutors on Monday, the 12th day of the trial, showed jurors business records documenting payments from Trump to his former lawyer, Cohen. A former employee of the Trump Organization testified that he was told by the company's top financial official that the payments were reimbursements to Cohen, not legal fees. Prosecutors said $420,000 was paid to Cohen in installments over 2017 and was meant to reimburse the lawyer, cover some of his costs and taxes, and included a $60,000 annual bonus. Not fair, but we will fight. Thank you. How's your defense team doing? The main players in the case have yet to testify, including Cohen and Daniels, whose real name is Stephanie Clifford. If found guilty, Trump could face up to four years in prison, though defendants typically face fines and probation. Well, the Paris 2024 Olympics are set to be the greenest games yet. But will initiatives such as recycled plastic stadium seats and accommodation sans aircon be enough to hit the organizers' climate goals? Or well, the preparations speak for themselves. So far, we've seen a host of green initiatives, including 11,000 stadium seats made from recycled plastic, a promise that a quarter of the athletes' food will be produced less than 155 miles from the place of competition, a pledge to double the amount of plant-based food on offer, and an additional 3,000 pay-as-you-go bikes for spectators to get around. Paris organizers aim to halve the carbon footprint of the Games, compared with the Rio 2016 and the London 2012 Summer Games. That 1.6 million metric tons of carbon dioxide produced over the course of only a few weeks is a significant amount, say experts like Martin Muller from the University of Lausanne. And that's roughly the annual carbon budget of a city of 1 million people uh, for 2050. You can see this as an equivalent, you know, you could run a city for a year uh, or you could host the Olympic Games. And so the 1.6 million, um, on the one hand, it's a significant improvement from um, previous Olympic Games. On the other hand, um, it's still a, a long way to go to actually get to where we need to get uh, by 2050 because we need to reduce carbon emissions by 90%. Let's go for a short commercial break now. More world news right after this. Welcome back. The first Monday in May came and went with a lot of fashionable and legendary moments just last night. Celebrities descended on New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art for the annual Met Gala. The extravagant event raises money for the museum's Costume Institute. Zendaya, Jennifer Lopez, Bad Bunny and Chris Hemsworth were co-chairs alongside Anna Wintour. This year's dress code was the Garden of Time, inspired by J.G. Ballard's 1962 dystopian 
and short story of the same name. A-listers came dressed in plenty of floral and botanical motifs as well as creative takes on decay and ruin. Zendaya, a host of this event, poised wearing a blue gown adorned with clusters of grapes and on the green and white carpeted entrance to the lavish gala. Jennifer Lopez, another host, wore a beaded see-through Schiaparelli gown Thor actor Chris Hemsworth and musician Bad Bunny also were named hosts of the evening. In some historic moments for the Met, pop culture was given honor as the first ever K-pop group to attend the gala, Stray Kids, was seen decked out in Tommy Hilfiger. The high-profile Met Gala is a benefit event for New York Metropolitan Museum of Art and marks the opening of its Costume Institute's annual fashion exhibit. This year's exhibit, called Sleeping Beauty's Reawakening Fashion, will feature rare items that have been dormant in the Costume Institute's permanent collection, including designs so fragile that they will be displayed only through animation and projections. Well, in my opinion, this time's Met was far more on theme. Sleeping Beauties, but no one slept on these amazing looks. But that's all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. Thank you very much for watching. Good night.